The V2, German Retribution Weapon 2. Technical name Aggregate 4 A4 was the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile. The missile, powered by a liquid propellant rocket engine, was developed during the Second World War in Germany as a vengeance weapon, assigned to attack allied cities as retaliation for the allied bombings against German cities. The V2 rocket also became the first man-made object to travel into space by crossing the Kármán line with the vertical launch of MW 18014 on the 20th of June 1944. Research into military use of long-range rockets began when the studies of graduate student Wernher von Braun attracted the attention of the German army. A series of prototypes culminated in the A4, which went to war as the V2. Beginning in September 1944, over 3,000 volts-2s were launched by the German Wehrmacht against Allied targets, first London and later Antwerp and Liege. According to a 2011 BBC documentary, the attacks from V-2s resulted in the deaths of an estimated 9,000 civilians and military personnel, and a further 12,000 forced laborers and concentration camp prisoners died as a result of their forced participation in the production of the weapons. As Germany collapsed, teams from the Allied forces, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union raced to capture key German manufacturing sites and technology. Wernher von Braun and over 100 key V 2 personnel surrendered to the Americans. Eventually, many of the original V 2 team ended up working at the Redstone Arsenal. The U.S. also captured enough V 2 hardware to build approximately 80 of the missiles. The Soviets gained possession of the V 2 manufacturing facilities after the war, re established V 2 production, and moved it to the Soviet Union. Developmental history In the late 1920s, a young Wernher von Braun bought a copy of Hermann Oberth's book, Die Rakete zu den Planetenraumen, The Rocket into Interplanetary Spaces. Starting in 1930, he attended the Technical University of Berlin, where he assisted Oberth in liquid-fueled rocket motor tests. Von Braun was working on his doctorate when the Nazi party gained power in Germany. An artillery captain, Walter Dornberger, arranged an Ordnance Department research grant for von Braun, who from then on worked next to Dornberger's existing solid-fuel rocket test site at Kummersdorf. Von Braun's thesis, Construction, Theoretical, and Experimental Solution to the Problem of the Liquid Propellant Rocket, dated 16 April 1934, was kept classified by the German Army and was not published until 1960. By the end of 1934, his group had successfully launched two rockets that reached heights of 2.2 and 3.5 kilometers, 1.4 and 2.2 miles. At the time, Germany was highly interested in American physicist Robert H. Goddard's research. Before 1939, German engineers and scientists occasionally contacted Goddard directly with technical questions. Von Braun used Goddard's plans from various journals and incorporated them into the building of the aggregate A series of rockets, named for the German word for mechanism or mechanical system. Following successes at Kummersdorf with the first two aggregate series rockets, Wernher von Braun and Walter Riedel began thinking of a much larger rocket in the summer of 1936, based on a projected 25,000 kg pounds) thrust engine. After the A4 project was postponed due to unfavorable aerodynamic stability testing of the A3 in July 1936, Von Braun specified the A4 performance in 1937, and, after an extensive series of test firings of the A5 scale test model, using a motor redesigned from the troublesome A3 by Walter Thiel, A4 design and construction was ordered c. 1938-39. During 28 to 30 September 1939, Der Tag der Weisheit English, the Day of Wisdom, conference met at Pienemunde to initiate the funding of university research to solve rocket problems. By late 1941, the Army Research Center at Pienemunde possessed the technologies essential to the success of the A4. The four key technologies for the A4 were large liquid fuel rocket engines, supersonic aerodynamics, gyroscopic guidance, and rudders in jet control. At the time, Adolf Hitler was not particularly impressed by the V-2, he pointed out that it was merely an artillery shell with a longer range and much higher cost. In early September 1943, von Braun promised the Long Range Bombardment Commission that the A-4 development was practically complete, concluded. But even by the middle of 1944, a complete A-4 parts list was still unavailable. Hitler was sufficiently impressed by the enthusiasm of its developers, and needed a wonder weapon 
To maintain German morale, so he authorized its deployment in large numbers, the V-2s were constructed at the Mittelwerk site by prisoners from Mittelbau Dora, a concentration camp where 12,000 to 20,000 prisoners died during the war. Technical details The A4 used a 74% ethanol, water mixture B -stoff, for fuel and liquid oxygen LOX, a stoff, for oxidizer. At launch the A4 propelled itself for up to 65 seconds on its own power, and a program motor controlled the pitch to the specified angle at engine shutdown, after which the rocket continued on a ballistic free-fall trajectory. The rocket reached a height of 80 kilometers, 50 miles after shutting off the engine. The fuel and oxidizer pumps were driven by a steam turbine and the steam was produced by concentrated hydrogen peroxide with sodium permanganate catalyst. Both the alcohol and oxygen tanks were an aluminium magnesium alloy. The combustion burner reached a temperature of 2500 to 2700 degrees Celsius, 4530 to 4890 degrees Fahrenheit. The alcohol water fuel was pumped along the double wall of the main combustion burner. This regenerative cooling heated the fuel and cooled the combustion chamber. The fuel was then pumped into the main burner chamber through 1,224 nozzles, which assured the correct mixture of alcohol and oxygen at all times. Small holes also permitted some alcohol to escape directly into the combustion chamber, forming a cooled boundary layer that further protected the wall of the chamber, especially at the throat where the chamber was narrowest. The boundary layer alcohol ignited on contact with the atmosphere, accounting for the long, diffuse exhaust plume. By contrast, later, post-V2 engine designs not employing this alcohol boundary layer cooling show a translucent plume with shock diamonds. The warhead was another source of troubles. The explosive employed was Amatol 6040ths detonated by an electric contact fuse. Amatol had the advantage of stability, and the warhead was protected by a thick layer of fiberglass, but even so it could still explode in the re-entry phase. The warhead weighed 975 kilograms 2,150 pounds and contained 910 kilograms 2,010 pounds of explosive. The warhead's percentage by weight that was explosive was 93%, a very high percentage when compared with other types of munition. The protective layer was used for the fuel tanks as well and the A4 did not have the tendency to form ice, which was common to other early missiles, like the balloon tank design SM-65 Atlas. The tanks held 4,173 kilograms 9, pounds of ethyl alcohol and 5,553 kilograms 12, pounds of oxygen. The V-2 was guided by four external rudders on the tail fins, and four internal graphite vanes in the jet stream at the exit of the motor. The LEV-3 guidance system consisted of two free gyroscopes a horizontal and a vertical for lateral stabilization, and a PIGA accelerometer to control engine cutoff at a specified velocity. The V-2 was launched from a pre-surveyed location, so the distance and azimuth to the target were known. Fin 1 of the missile was aligned to the target azimuth, some later V-2s used guide beams, radio signals transmitted from the ground, to keep the missile on course, but the first models used a simple analog computer that adjusted the azimuth for the rocket, and the flying distance was controlled by the timing of the engine cutoff. Brenschluss. Ground controlled by a Doppler system or by different types of onboard integrating accelerometers. The rocket stopped accelerating and soon reached the top of the approximately parabolic flight curve. Dr. Friedrich Kirkstein of Siemens of Berlin developed the V2 radio control for motor cutoff German, Brenschluss. For velocity measurement, Professor Wallmann of Dresden created an alternative of his Doppler tracking system in 1940-41, which used a ground signal transponded by the A4 to measure the velocity of the missile. By 9 February 1942, Pienemunde engineer De Beek had documented the radio interference area of a V-2 as 10,000 meters feet around the firing point, and the first successful A-4 flight on 3 October 1943, used radio control for Brenschluss. Although Hitler commented on of September 1943 that it is a great load off our minds that we have dispensed with the radio guiding beam, now no opening remains for the British to interfere technically with the missile in flight. About 20% of the operational V-2 launches were beam-guided. 
The Operation Penguin V-2 offensive began on 8 September 1944, when Leerund Versuchsbattery No. 444 English, Training and Testing Battery 444 launched a single rocket guided by a radio beam directed at Paris. Wreckage of combat V-2s occasionally contained the transponder for velocity and fuel cutoff. The painting of the operational V-2s was mostly a ragged-edged pattern with several variations, but at the end of the war a plain olive green rocket also appeared. During tests the rocket was painted in a characteristic black and white chessboard pattern, which aided in determining if the rocket was spinning around its longitudinal axis. The original German designation of the rocket was V2, unhyphenated, exactly as used for any Third Reich era. Second prototype, example of an RLM registered German aircraft design, but US publications such as Life magazine were using the hyphenated form V2 as early as December 1944. Topic. Testing The first successful test flight was on 3 October 1942, reaching an altitude of 84.5 km miles. Walter Dornberger, in a speech at Pienemunde of 3 October 1942, declared, This third day of October, 1942, is the first of a new era in transportation, that of space travel. Point one seven. Two test launches were recovered by the Allies, the Bakabo rocket, the remnants of which landed in Sweden on 13 June 1944 and one recovered by the Polish resistance on 30 May 1944 from Blizna and transported to the UK during Operation Most 3. The highest altitude reached during the war was 174.6 km 108.5 miles 20 June 1944. Test launches of V-2 rockets were made at Pienemunde, Blizna and Tukula Forest, and after the war, at Cuxhaven by the British, White Sands Proving Grounds and Cape Canaveral by the US, and Kapustin Yar by the USSR. Various design issues were identified and solved during V-2 development and testing. To reduce tank pressure and weight, high-flow turbopumps were used to boost pressure. A short and lighter combustion chamber without burn through was developed by using centrifugal injection nozzles, a mixing compartment, and a converging nozzle to the throat for homogeneous combustion. Film cooling was used to prevent burn through at the nozzle throat. Relay contacts were made more durable to withstand vibration and prevent thrust cutoff just after lift off. Ensuring that the fuel pipes had tension-free curves reduced the likelihood of explosions at 1,200 to 1,800 meters 4, to 6, feet. Fins were shaped with clearance to prevent damage as the exhaust jet expanded with altitude. To control trajectory at liftoff and supersonic speeds, heat-resistant graphite vanes were used as rudders in the exhaust jet. Topic. Air burst problem. Through mid-March 1944, only four of the 26 successful Blizna launches had satisfactorily reached the Sarnaki target area due to in-flight breakup Luftzelager, on re-entry into the atmosphere. As mentioned above, one rocket was collected by the Home Army, with parts of it transported to London for tests. Initially, the German developers suspected excessive alcohol tank pressure, but by April 1944, after five months of test firings, the cause was still not determined. Major General Rossman, the Army Weapons Office Department Chief, recommended stationing observers in the target area. C. May, June, Dornberger and von Braun set up a camp at the center of the Poland target zone. After moving to the Heidekraut, SS Mortar Battery 500 of the 836th Artillery Battalion motorized was ordered on 30 August to begin test launches of 80 sleeved rockets. Testing confirmed that the so-called tin trousers, a tube designed to strengthen the forward end of the rocket cladding, reduced the likelihood of air bursts. Topic: <laughs> Production. On the 22nd of December 1942, Hitler signed the order for mass production, when Albert Speer assumed final technical data would be ready by July 1943. However, many issues still remained to be solved even by the autumn of 1943. A production line was nearly ready at Pienemunde when the Operation Hydra attack caused the Germans to move production to the underground Mittelwerk in the Konstein where 5,200 V-2 rockets were built with the use of forced labor. Topic. 
Topic: Launch sites. Following Operation Crossbow Bombing, initial plans for launching from the massive underground Watton and Wizens bunkers or from fixed pads such as near the Château du Malay were dropped in favor of mobile launching. Eight main storage dumps were planned and four had been completed by July 1944 the one at Mairie-sur-Oise was begun in August 1943 and completed by February 1944. The missile could be launched practically anywhere, roads running through forests being a particular favorite. The system was so mobile and small that only one Milowagen was ever caught in action by Allied aircraft. During the Operation Badenplatte attack on 1 January 1945 near Lochem by a USAAF 4th Fighter Group aircraft, although Raymond Baxter described flying over a site during a launch and his wingman firing at the missile without hitting it. It was estimated that a sustained rate of 350 volts minus 2s could be launched per week, with 100 per days at maximum effort, given sufficient supply of the rockets. Topic. Operational history The LXV Army Corps Z. B. V. formed during the last days of November 1943 in France commanded by General Der Artillerie Z. V. Eric Heinemann was responsible for the operational use of V-2, after Hitler's 29 August 1944 declaration to begin V-2 attacks as soon as possible. The offensive began on 8 September 1944 with a single launch at Paris, which caused modest damage near Port de Tally. Two more launches by the 485th followed, including one from The Hague against London on the same day at 6.43 p.m. The first landed at Staveley Road, Chiswick, killing 63-year-old Mrs. A.D.A. Harrison, 3-year-old Rosemary Clark, and Sapper Bernard Browning on leave from the Royal Engineers, and one that hit Epping with no casualties. Upon hearing the double crack of the supersonic rocket London's first ever, Duncan Sandys and Reginald Victor Jones looked up from different parts of the city and exclaimed, That was a rocket! And a short while after the double crack, the sky was filled with the sound of a heavy body rushing through the air. The British government initially attempted to conceal the cause of the explosions by blaming them on defective gas mains. The public therefore began referring to the V-2s as flying gas pipes. The Germans themselves finally announced the V-2 on 8 November 1944 and only then, on 10 November 1944, did Winston Churchill inform Parliament, and the world, that England had been under rocket attack for the last few weeks. In September 1944 control of the V-2 mission was taken over by the Waffen-SS, positions of the German launch units changed a number of times. For example, artillery in at 444 arrived in the southwest Netherlands in Zealand in September 1944. From a field near the village of Saruskirk, five V-2s were launched on 15 and 16 September, with one more successful and one failed launch on 18. That same date, a transport carrying a missile took a wrong turn and ended up in Saruskirk itself, giving a villager the opportunity to surreptitiously take some photographs of the weapon. These were smuggled to London by the Dutch resistance. After that the unit moved to the woods near Rise, Gastland in the northwest Netherlands, to ensure that the technology did not fall into Allied hands. From Gastland V-2s were launched against Ipswich and Norwich from 25 September London being out of range. Because of their inaccuracy, these V-2s did not hit their target cities. Shortly after that only London and Antwerp remained as designated targets as ordered by Adolf Hitler himself, Antwerp being targeted in the period of 12 to 20 October, after which time the unit moved to The Hague. Over the next few months about 3,172 V-2 rockets were fired at the following targets. Belgium, 1664, Antwerp, 1610, Liege, 27, Hasselt, 13, Tournai, 9, Mons, 3, De Wyers, 2, United Kingdom, 1402, London, 1358, Norwich, 43, Ipswich, 1, France, 76, Lille, 25, Paris, 22, Turcoing, 19, Arras, 6, Cambrai, 4, Netherlands, 19, Maastricht, 19, Germany, 11, Remagen, 11, an estimated 2,754 civilians were killed in London by V-2 attacks with another 6,523 injured, which is two people killed per V-2 rocket. However, this understates the potential of the V-2, since many rockets were misdirected and exploded harmlessly. Accuracy increased over the course of the war, particularly for batteries where the Leitstrahl radio guide beam system was used. 
missile strikes that found targets could cause large numbers of deaths. 160 were killed and 108 seriously injured in one explosion at 12.26 p.m. on 25 November 1944, at a Woolworths department store in New Cross, southeast London. British intelligence sent false reports via their double-cross system implying that the rockets were overshooting their London target by 10 to 20 miles 16 to 32 kilometers. This tactic worked, more than half of the V-2s aimed at London landed outside the London Civil Defence region. Most landed on less heavily populated areas in Kent due to erroneous recalibration. For the remainder of the war, British intelligence kept up the ruse by repeatedly sending bogus reports implying that the rockets were now striking the British capital with heavy loss of life. Antwerp, Belgium was also the target for a large number of V-weapon attacks from October 1944 through March 1945, leaving 1,736 dead and 4,500 injured in Greater Antwerp. Thousands of buildings were damaged or destroyed as the city was struck by 590 direct hits. The largest loss of life in a single attack came on 16 December 1944, when the roof of the crowded cinema Rex was struck, leaving 567 dead and 291 injured. Topic. Possible use during Operation Badenplatt At least one V-2 missile on a mobile Milawagan launch trailer was observed being elevated to launch position by a USAAF 4th Fighter Group pilot defending against the massive New Year's Day 1945 Operation Badenplatz strike by the Luftwaffe over the northern German attack route near the town of Lochem on 1 January 1945. Possibly, from the potential sighting of the American fighter by the missile's launch crew, the rocket was quickly lowered from a near launch ready 85 degrees elevation to 30 degrees. Topic. Tactical use After the U.S. Army captured the Ludendorff Bridge during the Battle of Remagen, the Germans were desperate to destroy it. On 17 March 1945, they fired 11 V-2 missiles at the bridge, the first use against a tactical target. They could not employ the more accurate Leitstrahl device because it was oriented towards Antwerp and could not be easily adjusted for another target. Fired from near Hellendorn, the Netherlands, one of the missiles landed as far away as Cologne, 40 miles 64 kilometers to the north, while one missed the bridge by only 500 to 800 yards 460 to 730 meters. They also struck the town of Remagen, destroying a number of buildings and killing at least six American soldiers. Topic. Final use. The final two rockets exploded on 27 March 1945. One of these was the last V-2 to kill a British civilian, Mrs. Ivy Millichamp, aged 34, killed in her home in Kiniston Road, Orpington in Kent. A scientific reconstruction carried out in 2010 demonstrated that the V-2 creates a crater 20 metres 66 feet wide and 8 metres 26 feet deep, ejecting approximately 3,000 tonnes of material into the air. Topic. Post-war history After the Nazi defeat, German engineers were moved to the United States, the United Kingdom and the USSR, where they further developed the V-2 rocket for military and civilian purposes. The V-2 rocket also laid the foundation for the liquid fuel missiles and space launchers used later. Topic. Countermeasures. Topic. Big Ben and Crossbow Unlike the V-1, the V-2's speed and trajectory made it practically invulnerable to anti-aircraft guns and fighters, as it dropped from an altitude of 100 to 110 kilometers 62 to 68 miles at up to three times the speed of sound at sea level approximately 3,550 kilometers per hour. Nevertheless, the threat of what was then code-named Big Ben was great enough that efforts were made to seek countermeasures. The situation was similar to the pre-war concerns about manned bombers and led to a similar solution, the formation of the Crossbow Committee to collect, examine and develop countermeasures. 
Early on, it was believed that the V-2 employed some form of radio guidance, a belief that persisted in spite of several rockets being examined without discovering anything like a radio receiver. This led to efforts to jam this non-existent guidance system as early as September 1944, using both ground and air-based jammers flying over the UK. In October, a group had been sent to jam the missiles during launch. By December it was clear these systems were having no obvious effect, and jamming efforts ended. Anti-aircraft gun system General Frederick Alfred Pyle, commander of Anti-Aircraft Command, studied the problem and proposed that enough anti-aircraft guns were available to produce a barrage of fire in the rocket's path, but only if provided with a reasonable prediction of the trajectory. The first estimates suggested that 320,000 shells would have to be fired for each rocket. About 2% of these were expected to fall back to the ground, almost 90 tons of rounds, which would cause far more damage than the missile. At a 25 August 1944 meeting of the Crossbow Committee, the concept was rejected. Pyle continued studying the problem, and returned with a proposal to fire only 150 shells at a single rocket, with those shells using a new fuse that would greatly reduce the number that fell back to Earth unexploded. Some low-level analysis suggested that this would be successful against one in 50 rockets, provided that accurate trajectories were forwarded to the gunners in time. Work on this basic concept continued and developed into a plan to deploy a large number of guns in Hyde Park that were provided with pre-configured firing data for 2.5-mile grids of the London area. After the trajectory was determined, the guns would aim and fire between 60 and 500 rounds. At a crossbow meeting on 15 January 1945 Pyle's updated plan was presented with some strong advocacy from Roderick Hill and Charles Drummond Ellis. However, the committee suggested that a test not be carried out as no technique for tracking the missiles with sufficient accuracy had yet been developed. By March this had changed significantly, with 81% of incoming missiles correctly allotted to the grid square each fell into, or the one beside it. At a 26 March meeting the plan moved ahead, and Pyle was directed to a subcommittee with R. V. Jones and Ellis to further develop the statistics. Three days later the team returned a report stating that if the guns fired 2,000 rounds at a missile there was a 1 in 60 chance of shooting it down. Plans for an operational test began, but as Pyle later put it, Monty beat us to it. As the attacks ended with the Allied liberation of their launching areas, with the Germans no longer in control of any part of the continent that could be used as a launching site capable of striking London, they turned their attention on Antwerp. Plans were made to move the pile system to protect that city, but the war ended before anything could be done. Topic. Direct attack Another defense against the V-2 campaign was to destroy the launch infrastructure, expensive in terms of bomber resources and casualties, or to cause the Germans to aim at the wrong place through disinformation. The British were able to convince the Germans to direct V-1s and V-2s aimed at London to less populated areas east of the city. This was done by sending deceptive reports on the damage caused and sites hit via the German espionage network in Britain, which was controlled by the British, the Double Cross system, according to the BBC television presenter Raymond Baxter, who served with the RAF during the war. In February 1945 his squadron was carrying out a mission against a V-2 launch site, when one missile was launched in front of them. One member of Baxter's squadron opened fire on it, without effect. On 3 March 1945 the Allies attempted to destroy V-2s and launching equipment in the Hague Se Boss in The Hague by a large-scale bombardment, but due to navigational errors the Bezoudenhout quarter was destroyed, killing 511 Dutch civilians. Churchill sent a scathing minute to General Ismay requesting a thorough explanation for this extraordinarily bad aiming. Topic. Assessment The German V-weapons V1 and V2 cost the equivalent of around USD $40 billion $2015, which was 50% more than the Manhattan Project that produced the atomic bomb. 6,048 volts minus twos were built, at a cost of approximately 100,000 Reichsmark GB 2,370,000 pounds 2011 each, 3,225 were launched. 
SS General Hans Kammler, who as an engineer had constructed several concentration camps including Auschwitz, had a reputation for brutality and had originated the idea of using concentration camp prisoners as slave laborers in the rocket program. More people died manufacturing the V-2 than were killed by its deployment. The V-2 consumed a third of Germany's fuel alcohol production and major portions of other critical technologies. To distill the fuel alcohol for one V-2 launch required 30 tons of potatoes at a time when food was becoming scarce. Due to a lack of explosives, some warheads were simply filled in with concrete, using the kinetic energy alone for destruction, and sometimes the warhead contained photographic propaganda of German citizens who had died in Allied bombings. The psychological effect of the V 2 was considerable, as the V 2, traveling faster than the speed of sound, gave no warning before impact, unlike bombing planes or the V 1 flying bomb, which made a characteristic buzzing sound. There was no effective defense and no risk of pilot and crew casualties. With the war all but lost, regardless of the factory output of conventional weapons, the Nazis resorted to V-weapons as a tenuous last hope to influence the war militarily, hence Antwerp's V-2 target, as an extension of their desire to punish their foes and most importantly to give hope to their supporters with their miracle weapon. The V-2 had no effect on the outcome of the war, but it led to the ICBMs of the Cold War that were used for space exploration. Unfulfilled plans A submarine-towed launch platform was tested successfully, making it the prototype for submarine-launched ballistic missiles. The project codename was Proof Stand 12, Test Stand 12, sometimes called the Rocket U-Boat. If deployed, it would have allowed a U-boat to launch V-2 missiles against United States cities, though only with considerable effort and limited effect. Hitler, in July 1944 and Speer, in January 1945, made speeches alluding to the scheme, though Germany did not possess the capability to fulfill these threats. These schemes were met by the Americans with Operation Teardrop, while interned after the war by the British at CSDIC Camp 11, Dornberger was recorded saying that he had begged the Führer to stop the V-weapon propaganda, because nothing more could be expected from one ton of explosive. To this Hitler had replied that Dornberger might not expect more, but he Hitler, certainly did, according to decrypted messages from the Japanese embassy in Germany, 12 dismantled V-2 rockets were shipped to Japan. These left Bordeaux in August 1944 on the transport U-boats U-219 and U-195, which reached Jakarta in December 1944. A civilian V-2 expert was a passenger on U-234, bound for Japan in May 1945 when the war ended in Europe. The fate of these V-2 rockets is unknown. Post-war use At the end of the war, a race began between the United States and the USSR to retrieve as many V-2 rockets and staff as possible. 300 rail car loads of V-2s and parts were captured and shipped to the United States and 126 of the principal designers, including Wernher von Braun and Walter Dornberger, were in American hands. Von Braun, his brother Magnus von Braun, and seven others decided to surrender to the United States military Operation Paperclip to ensure they were not captured by the advancing Soviets or shot dead by the Nazis to prevent their capture. Topic. Britain In October 1945, British Operation Backfire assembled a small number of V-2 missiles and launched three of them from a site in northern Germany. The engineers involved had already agreed to move to the US when the test firings were complete. The Backfire report remains the most extensive technical documentation of the rocket, including all support procedures, tailored vehicles, and fuel composition. In 1946, the British Interplanetary Society proposed an enlarged man carrying version of the V 2, called Megarock. It could have enabled sub orbital spaceflight similar to, but at least a decade earlier than, the Mercury Redstone flights of 1961. United States Operation Paperclip recruited German engineers and Special Mission V-2 transported the captured V-2 parts to the United States. 
At the close of the Second World War, over 300 rail cars filled with V2 engines, fuselages, propellant tanks, gyroscopes, and associated equipment were brought to the rail yards in Las Cruces, New Mexico, so they could be placed on trucks and driven to the White Sands Proving Grounds, also in New Mexico. In addition to V2 hardware, the U.S. government delivered German mechanization equations for the V2 guidance, navigation, and control systems, as well as for advanced development concept vehicles, to U.S. defense contractors for analysis. In the 1950s some of these documents were useful to U.S. contractors in developing direction cosine matrix transformations and other inertial navigation architecture concepts that were applied to early U.S. programs such as the Atlas and Minuteman guidance systems as well as the Navy's SUBS inertial navigation system. A committee was formed with military and civilian scientists to review payload proposals for the reassembled V-2 rockets. This led to an eclectic array of experiments that flew on V-2s and paved the way for American manned space exploration. Devices were sent aloft to sample the air at all levels to determine atmospheric pressures and to see what gases were present. Other instruments measured the level of cosmic radiation. Only 68% of the V-2 trials were considered successful. A supposed V-2 launched on 29 May 1947 landed near Juarez, Mexico and was actually a Hermes B-1 vehicle. The U.S. Navy attempted to launch a German V-2 rocket at sea. One test launch from the aircraft carrier USS Midway was performed on 6 September 1947 as part of the Navy's Operation Sandy. The test launch was a partial success. The V-2 went off the pad but splashed down in the ocean only some 10 kilometers 6 miles from the carrier. The launch setup on the Midway's deck is notable in that it used foldaway arms to prevent the missile from falling over. The arms pulled away just after the engine ignited, releasing the missile. The setup may look similar to the R-7 launch procedure but in the case of the R-7 the trusses hold the full weight of the rocket, rather than just reacting to side forces. The PGM-11 Redstone rocket is a direct descendant of the V-2. Topic. USSR The USSR also captured a number of V-2s and staff, letting them stay in Germany for a time. The first work contracts were signed in the middle of 1945. In October 1946, as part of Operation Asoviakim, they were obliged to move to Branch 1 of Ni-88 on Gorodomlia Island in Lake Seliga where Helmut Grotrup headed up a group of 150 engineers. In October 1947, a group of German scientists supported USSR in launching rebuilt V-2s in Kapustin Yar. The German team was indirectly overseen by Sergei Korolev, the chief designer of the Soviet rocketry program. The first Soviet missile was the R-1, a duplicate of the V-2 completely manufactured in Russia, which was first launched in September 1948. From 1947 until the end of 1950, the German team elaborated concepts and improvements for extended payload and range under the projects G1, G2 and G4. The German team had to remain on Gorodomlia Island until as late as 1952 and 1953. In parallel, Soviet work was focused on larger missiles, the R2 and R5, based on further developing the V2 technology with using ideas of the German concept studies. Details of Soviet achievements were unknown to the German team and completely underestimated by Western intelligence until, in November 1957, the Sputnik 1 satellite was successfully launched to orbit by the Sputnik rocket based on R-7, the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. In the autumn of 1945, the group led by M. Tihonravov K. and N. G. Chernyshov at Ni-4 Rocket Artillery Institute of the USSR Academy of Sciences developed on their own initiative the first stratospheric rocket project. BP-190 called for vertical flight of two pilots to an altitude of 200 km using captured German V-2 rockets. <inaudible> <inaudible> Surviving V-2 examples and components At least 20 volts minus 2 still existed in 2014. Topic. Australia One at the Australian War Memorial, Canberra, including complete Milowagon transporter. The rocket has the most complete set of guidance components of all surviving A4s. The Milowagon is the most complete of the three examples known to exist. Another A4 was on display at the RAF Museum at Point Cook outside Melbourne. 
Both rockets now reside in Canberra. Topic: Netherlands. One example, partly skeletonized, is in the collection of the Royal Netherlands Army Museum. In this collection are also a launching table and some loose parts, as well as the remains of a V-2 that crashed in The Hague immediately after launch. Topic. Poland Several large components, like hydrogen peroxide tank and reaction chamber, the propellant turbopump and the HWK rocket engine chamber partly cut out are displayed at the Polish Aviation Museum in Kraków. A reconstruction of a V-2 missile containing multiple original recovered parts is on display at the Armia Krajowa Museum in Kraków. Topic. France One engine at Cite de l'Espace in Toulouse. V-2 display including engine, parts, rocket body and many documents and photographs relating to the development and use at Le Coupole Museum, Wizens, Par de Calais. One rocket body no engine, one complete engine, one lower engine section and one wrecked engine on display at Le Coupole Museum. One engine complete with steering pallets, feed lines and tank bottoms, plus one cut-out thrust chamber and one cut-out turbopump at the Snecma Space Engines Div. Museum in Vernon. One complete rocket in World War II wing of the Musée de l'Armée Army Museum in Paris. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Germany. One complete missile and an additional engine at the Deutsches Museum in Munich. One engine at the German Museum of Technology in Berlin. One engine at the Deutsches Historisches Museum in Berlin. One rusty engine in the original V2 underground production facilities at the Dora Mittelbau concentration camp memorial site. One rusty engine in Buchenwald concentration camp own replica was constructed for the Historical and Technical Information Center in Peenemunde, where it is displayed near what remains of the factory where it was built. Topic. United Kingdom One at the Science Museum, London. One, on loan from Cranfield University, at the Imperial War Museum, London. The RAF Museum has two rockets, one of which is displayed at its Cosford site. The museum also owns a Mylerwagen, a Vidalwagen, a Strabo crane, and a firing table with towing dolly. One at the Royal Engineers Museum in Chatham, Kent. A propulsion unit minus injectors is in Norfolk and Suffolk Aviation Museum near Bungie. A complete turbopump is at Solway Aviation Museum, Carlisle Airport as part of the Blue Streak rocket exhibition. The Venturi segment of one discovered in April 2012 was donated to the Harwich Sailing Club after they found it buried in a mudflat. Fuel combustion chamber recovered from the sea near Clacton at the East Essex Aviation Museum, St. Oyst. A gyroscope unit is on display at the National Space Center in Leicester. A turbopump unit on display at the National Space Center in Leicester. A steam generating chamber on display at the National Space Center in Leicester. Topic United States Complete Missile Zone at the Flying Heritage Collection, Everett Washington 1 at the National Museum of the United States Air Force, including Complete Mylerwagen, Dayton, Ohio. One chessboard painted at the Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas. One at the National Air and Space Museum, Washington, D.C. One at the Fort Bliss Air Defense Museum, El Paso, Texas. One yellow and black at Missile Park, White Sands Missile Range in White Sands, New Mexico. One at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. One at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, Component Zone Engine at the Stafford Air and Space Museum in Weatherford, Oklahoma. One engine at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Two engines at the National Museum of the United States Air Force one was transferred from United States Army Ordnance Museum in Aberdeen, Maryland around 2005 when the museum closed. Combustion chambers and other components plus a U.S. built engine at the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center in Dulles, Virginia. One engine at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. One rocket body at Picatinny Arsenal in Dover, N.J. One engine in the Auburn University Engineering Lab One engine in the exhibit hall adjacent to the Blockhouse Building on the historic Cape Canaveral Tour in Cape Canaveral, Florida. 
one engine at Parks College of Engineering, Aviation and Technology in St. Louis, Missouri, one engine and tail section at New Mexico Museum of Space History in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Topic. See also V-1 flying bomb V-3 cannon Notes <laughs> <laughs>